Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. I'm Shelly sitting in the host chair today. I'm flying solo in the sense that Alexis hasn't joined me today, but I am definitely not flying solo. We've actually brought the uh, the three-passenger version of the magical What If Machine today, and I'm joined by what frequent listeners to the podcast should recognize as being familiar voices. I'm joined today by Chris Coppola and by Brent Frost, who have both participated together and separately on the podcast before, but uh, I'm glad to have them here today as we explore uh, what I think is a very interesting historical what if, and that could go a lot of different ways. In fact, we were just talking off podcast, getting ready for the recording to start here, that we probably will find ourselves coming back and revisiting this topic a number of different times over time, uh, because it has a lot of different flavors and a lot of different shades. Before I head down that path, I'm going to let the two guys uh, introduce themselves, get you familiar again with their voices, and then... uh, after we do that, Chris, I'm going to have you, since you actually suggested in some ways what our fork would be uh, for this topic today, I'm going to let you be the introductor on that. So I'm going to go to Brant first to reintroduce himself, and then when Brant's done, Brant, if you'll hand that over to Chris, Chris can pick it up from there and we'll get rolling on this. Thank you very much, Don. It's great to be with you here today. I'm, as you all know, I've participated in a couple of these before, and I always enjoy it. It's a fascinating subject. I often feel that It's also sort of the subject for advanced students of history as well, because you really got to know your subject to appreciate the fine intricacies that is history and how it could have gone in different ways. So this is a subject which uh, in times before wasn't as appreciated and kind of looked down on by historians, but it's becoming more and more appreciated as something that is worthy of consideration and study and it's helpful in our own time to understand about the implications of decisions made by politicians and statesmen and generals, and sometimes just your average private. So over to you, Chris, and it's good to be with you here today. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Coppola. I've been on a couple of these before, and I'd like to echo everything they said and just go ahead and get right into the scenario here. Um, what the basic premise of this is, is if the United States does not drop the atomic bombs on Japan in 1945. Not in the sense that we choose not to, but in the sense that we just do not have them. Um, And the fork here, there's two forks. First centers around a Japanese program called Fugo. And this project, launched balloons into the jet stream, kind of an echo back to our weather history earlier. Um, And the basis, basic idea is they launch these high altitude balloons into the jet stream. The jet stream carries them across the Pacific in a matter of a couple of days, and they are timed to explode and drop incendiary devices on whatever's below them. Um, and this was actually successful in, in some ways. They did hit the United States um, as far east as Detroit and Texas, but mainly in uh, British Columbia and the United States Pacific Northwest. The key about that is there's this little place called Hanford, Washington, which is where the United States had built its primary plutonium production facility and uh, the Fugo devices started being launched uh, November 2nd, 1944. The Hanford reactor went critical and started producing plutonium November 6th, 1944. So our fork is all of a sudden you have these incendiary devices dropping in the U.S. Pacific Northwest and The thing about where Hanford is located, it's not, you know, the picture of a conifer forest. It's in high desert. It's flat, it's dry, and it's very susceptible to wildfires. Um, Actually, 
um, we're recording this in August of 2020 and kind of a callback to you know, what's going on around now. Um, this summer, they had a wildfire on the Hanford site that was caused just by a lightning strike. So, you know, when you have incendiary devices, it could get a lot worse. Um, so the fork is that we, the Manhattan Project, realizes this facility, which is producing highly radioactive substances, is vulnerable to attack this way and has to shut down production. Um, that's critical because based upon the physics, plutonium was the most effective way to do, to produce a nuclear bomb. And um, not having that plutonium is really going to set back the United States Manhattan Project in trying to get, trying to develop a nuclear weapon. We're going to. Um, in my scenario, we probably would rebuild, um, I'm actually thinking Las Vegas area because it's an area that has a hydroelectric dam to provide power for the plant. It's closer to Los Alamos where they're assembling and doing testing. And also um, another fun, interesting fact, uh, right outside of Las Vegas is an area that the United States used to test nuclear weapons, uh, the Nevada test site. And at the early stages, when Las Vegas was developing, they advertised the test schedule so people could, as a tourist attraction, go sit on the roof and watch nuclear weapons be tested out in the Nevada desert. Um, so I think, you know, we would have developed a plutonium plant in that area. We definitely would have been able to produce one, but time marches on. And we, you know, we're not going to put the whole war on hold just so we can develop another plant. Um, the other thing, you know, plutonium, 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 we still had the issue of the uranium bomb produced at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, the thing about that is the warship that the United States used to deliver the uranium for that bomb to Tinian to be dropped on Hiroshima was the USS Indianapolis. Um, it successfully delivered it to Tinian, and on its trip from there to rejoin the rest of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, it was torpedoed by a Japanese submarine lost with a heavy loss of life. So the other minor fork here is it gets torpedoed before it delivers the uranium to Tinian. So now we're not producing plutonium. We don't have the uranium for Little Boy and we have to go ahead with conventional forces. That means probably the scheduled invasion of Japan in November 1945. And that also means the Soviet invasion of Manchuria starting in August 9th, 1945. So uh, I, I think that's the setup. <laughs> Yeah, I think you've done it very well there. So as we talked about a little bit off podcast, you know, one of the things that's often discussed around, and, and Brant sort of alluded to this, is, you know, around the, if you will, the moral decision uh, for, that was made by President Truman to utilize atomic weapons at that point in time to, uh, we know from the real time out of history, it actually did very quickly bring the war to a conclusion and to a uh, close in the Pacific. The, the war in Europe had already come to a close. But we didn't want to focus on the moral issue, you know, although that's an important discussion to have, I think, for lots of reasons, but really just focus on that's not an option that's on the table. And so when I first had thought about that and suggested that, Chris was actually the one who ingeniously came up with, well, what if it was like this? Because I was trying to figure out how do you just not have it? Because, you know, eventually I, I think they, they would have had it no matter what. Even if you say there's a setback in the research or whatever, this is just a setback in having the raw material that you need. They know how to build one. They just don't have what they need. I think that creates a very compelling, and also as a, from the example that Chris has given here, potentially historic, you know, accurately historic you know, mode by what, how that would have happened. If there's a limited number of production facilities, both of them had vulnerabilities and or the transport of the material. And so that's how you end up where you are. So that's what we're actually gonna we'll go down the path today. Our historical what if is what if there had not been the August 6th of 1945, subsequently the August 9th, 1945 dropping of the two atomic weapons uh, that have actually been dropped in anger in history. Uh, that would be Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
and how things would have progressed beyond that. So what we're going to do here really quick before we get and head down that path, probably actually talk very briefly about the historical what did, because I think everybody knows the historical what did. We're going to take just a quick break here from uh, one of the folks that helped us make the podcast possible. So we'll be back in just a second. Would groceries delivered to you in as fast as one hour save you a trip to the store? Instacart makes that possible thanks to personal shoppers in your area who hand-select items based on your preferences from the stores you love. And shopping multiple stores is possible on a single order. Instacart picks the freshest produce and even keeps your eggs safe, all while finding everything you usually buy, providing smart suggestions for new items, and even highlighting deals to help you save money. And now you get free delivery on your first order over $35. Let Instacart know we sent you and help support our show by following the link in the show notes. Instacart, groceries delivered in as fast as one hour. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alder Industry Podcast. Uh, we spent a little time uh, talking with and getting reintroduced to our guests today, uh, Brant and Chris, and set up the historical what if that we're going to be looking at today, which is what would have happened if the, uh, the United States had, uh, had not had the option of dropping an atomic weapon uh, on August of 1945 to bring a more swift conclusion to the war. And so the, as Alexis and I always talk about on our episodes, we probably have to talk a little bit about the historical what did, but we probably don't need to go far here. Uh, but my summary of the historical what did, and I'll let Brent and Chris jump in on anything they want to add to that, was uh, Harry Truman makes the decision as U.S. president that is, for a number of reasons, we'll talk about some of, the, some of what those reasons may be, because if he doesn't have the option, that plays in, makes the decision to use the, the super weapons, these atomic weapons that have been developed through the Manhattan Project, uh, the bomb on Hiroshima, and then subsequently the bomb on Nagasaki, uh, and that brings the war to a swift conclusion. Uh, the Japanese Empire uh, surrenders unconditionally, which had been the desire and, and, the, and the goal uh, of the Allies is to have not a conditional surrender, but an unconditional surrender. And so very quickly, we have those famous images that we're accustomed to, which is the signing, of, uh, the formalizing the end of that signed on the deck of the Missouri there in, in Tokyo Harbor uh, that happens very quickly after the dropping of the bombs and the, uh, and the decision by the Empire of Japan to surrender. Is there anything else you guys think that really needs to be covered on the historical what did that is essential that we set it up and remind people of before we head down the what if? Yes, one thing. Um, I, I, one of the reasons I find this topic so interesting is there's a lot of ways to look at it. And what we just heard was, you know, a very popular one interpretation of it. But August 9th, the same day that we dropped the second bomb on Nagasaki, the Soviet Union finally honored agreements we had made with them at Yalta and declared war on Japan and came into Manchuria and Korea on the exact same day that we bombed Nagasaki. So the debate, and, and I don't know how much we're going to get into this, but I know the Soviet involvement is critical. Um, the debate is what pushed Japan over the edge. There was a dual punch on that same day, and that that's a debate that still goes on. Agreed. Brent, any thoughts from you on just the historical what if? Did before we launch down the what if path? It it is a very it is a very interesting. Um, uh, idea, and I think that Chris is on to something about the Soviet factor. Given the incredible volume of ex of explosives and bombs that had already been used on Japan, it seems unlikely that two more bombs, albeit very powerful ones, would have persuaded them to surrender. The Curtis LeMay's Air Force was firebombing Japanese cities with an incredible effectiveness. And it might have, sure, it took them 10,000 bombs or 1,000 bombs to do what one atomic bomb did. Nonetheless, they had them, and they were doing it. So the, the impact on the ground would not have been all that different as far as the da damage affected. Whereas a major change in the political and geopolitical landscape and military landscape was the invasion by the Soviet Union of Manchuria and the assumed 
imminent invasion of the Japanese home islands, specifically a soccer in Hokkaido by the Soviet army. So I think that that has to be given due consideration into the into Japanese thinking. I, I agree. And I think we definitely will cover that as we start moving down the what if here, because uh, that, that's actually what we're going to find ourselves in what would have happened, uh, obviously. If, uh, if it didn't come to an end, and I think it came to an end for most of the reasons that we've just talked about there, and a number of them are there, uh, but that also plays into what happens if, if that's not there. So I'm going to throw it open here, and I, as I was telling the guys off podcast, one of the things I love about having each of these guys as a guest is not only their knowledge, which I have a tremendous amount of respect for, for history and their ability to articulate what they want to say, and they can do it far better than I can, but it's also about the fact that uh, when I have these two guys on, I don't have to carry much of the load because they, they do a lot of they do a lot of the heavy lifting all of their own. So, Chris, I'm going to open the floor for you first to the first what if that you imagine uh, again under the scenario now where we've hit August 6th. Uh, Harry Truman has no weapon, no super weapon to drop. Things are moving along the lines of the Soviet involvement that we're now becoming more involved in, in the theater there. Uh, what's the first things that pop into your mind about the what if that you think are intriguing or interesting to our audience? Uh, first and foremost, I, I think, I think this is going to be a Russian episode. Um, the biggest thing is I think they sweep Manchuria all the way down Korea. Korea is not divided. Korea is all DPRK today. Um, they're able to take Sakhalin and I agree with Brant Hokkaido, um, in, in all of the American literature on this, the Americans, the, the projections for Operation Downfall, which is the overall name for the invasion of the Japanese home islands, say that the United States would lose, depending upon the source, a million soldiers in that operation. And that is a big, that's a big deal to uh, Truman. It is not such a big deal to Stalin. And so I think looking at Japanese um, force distribution, they can take Hokkaido and they're pretty easily going to be able to cross onto the main island of Honshu. And so the United States is going to be in a position of rushing its plans ahead to try and get ashore and get something in Japan so that, you know, kind of like we're trying to meet them in Germany as far east as possible, we're trying to meet them in Japan as far north as possible. Yeah, I, I, my, the image in my head there is just like we had the race to Berlin. You have the, you have some version of the race to Tokyo, right? Yes. yes. Uh, I, oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Go ahead, Brett. Yes, except you have to factor in two things. Um, Frank the Roosevelt uh, coddled Joseph Stalin and appeased him to no end, whereas Harry Truman was far more uh, was far more skeptical and far more anti-communist and anti-Soviet, and just uh, than Roosevelt was, and also uh, Douglas MacArthur was far more. Um, suspicious and anti-communist than Eisenhower was. So unlike in, Europe, unlike in Europe where the decision was made to be more accommodating to the Soviets, I would see Truman and MacArthur definitely tr trying to cut the, Jap the uh, Soviets off at the knees. So if there was a threat of a Japanese invasion of, um, of the main island of Honshu, then I can see the Americans landing at the north end in a secondary operation just to keep them off. Although, given how f fiercely the Japanese would have defended Hokkaido, it would have taken the Soviets a while to, uh, to, to push through. Given their record in Eastern Europe, the Soviet army was very good at attacking, um, but they weren't too good at winning. And by that, I mean the Germans, even though outnumbered three, five, even 10 to one, were able to hold them off with great ferocity and great success. In many cases, it took a lot of you know human meat to uh, to uh, choke the German wolf. So I suspect that the Japanese would have held 
the Soviets up on Hal Kaido for many months before they were finally, for, you know, before the island was finally secured. Think about the Battle of Okinawa and now project that onto an island as big as Hunt is Hal Kaido. Um, yeah, it would have been a long, long, hard fight. So the jet, it might very well have been that we would have secured enough of Han Chu in the northern end to prevent them from going any farther by the time they were finished with Al Qaeda. Because yeah. remember also, remember also Truman, like I said before, Truman and MacArthur were anti-Soviet and were in no, uh, no way seeking to appease Stalin as opposed to Roosevelt, who had almost this sense of, you know, paternal, um, but, you know, paternal, uh, feeling towards Stalin, like, you know, oh, bless his heart. We've got to help him along. He's got a, he's had a hard life. You know, we got to be nice to him and he'll understand how, you know, if we're nice to him, he'll be nice to us. Uh, there was none of that in Harry Truman. Yeah, a, a, a different personality there. I get, one of the questions I would just throw out here for, for either of you guys is that, uh, do you think that there's, because of, I think everyone agrees that, um, based upon what we saw in other parts of the Pacific theater, uh, the Japanese culture and their military code, uh, it literally was, you know, fighting to the last man, woman, and child. Uh, surrender was not an honorable thing. Uh, so the, there, was, there was already something that was bent against that. It's the defense of their homeland. It's not even defense of some of these islands. That, that's one of the things I've often heard about Okinawa is that you know, even being different from the other defenses in the Pacific is the Japanese thought of that as being sort of like essentially one of the home islands. And so you know, e even the ferocity with which the defense was fought there was, uh, uh, was even more extreme. Uh, there, there's no scenario given the complexity of an island invasion, the moving of material, again, that whole thing I've just described there, that there would have been tremendous loss of life on both sides. Do either of you think that there eventually would have been a stalemate as opposed to a victory. And so we would have ended up with some type of solution because of just as this thing was mounting, both, both sides or all sides sort of realizing we've got to come to some type of compromised solution, or even though it's not what maybe any of us want. Do you, you think we would have gone down that path or would have ultimately ended up with, um, you're going to have, you're going to have to defeat us because we're not going to come to any form of compromise. I guess that may be a better way to phrase the question. Chris, do you have any thoughts on that? So that question is two part. First, would the Soviets have compromised? No, period. Um, would the Americans have compromised? I am not sure. It's, something tells me no. And the reason I say that is, Looking back at how the war started, you know, we mentioned, okay, once Europe is over, there's kind of a wa wavering American support. But the fact is, this is the first war. This is the initial one. This is how we got in. Japan attacked us. And that simple fact, I, I don't see much American support for any kind of deal that would be acceptable to Japan. Okay. Brett, do you agree, disagree, have any th different thoughts on that? Yeah, that's, that's very difficult to say, given all the factors involved. The Soviets would not have wanted to make a deal because they were they had the advantage for sure. There would be no uh, inclination in that regard. The American public, you, know, you have to also remember World War II and it's, it's very difficult to get into the minds of the people in that time and we can only do the best we can. But you have to remember that America basically won that war on the cheap. And that sounds strange, but when you look at the huge casualties suffered by the Soviets, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Germans, comparatively speaking, the United States won that war with a very light loss of life. And that was not an accident. Admiral William Lay and Franklin Roosevelt, you know, Lay was, at, was Roosevelt's chief advisor. He was the first de facto chairman of the Joint Chiefs. They had an option. George Marshall wanted to have a much larger army, and have huge, you know, have huge uh, you know, land armies that could fight in Europe and Asia. And uh, Leahy and Roosevelt uh, made the decision to focus more on the Navy and the Air Force and fight a more strategic warfare, uh, similar to how the British 
fought the Napoleonic Wars, where they provided some of the manpower, but mostly they provided money, materiel, and a navy. And the result of that strategy was a much lighter American loss of life. We used the Soviet Union as basically uh, our manpower source and funded them. And as a result, the uh, casualties from World War II for America was very light. If, on the other hand, we begin experiencing more casualties in a few months than we experienced in the first two years of the war during the invasion of Japan, I doubt the American public would have wanted to have a peace or a settlement. But President Truman, out of just seeing the casualty numbers, might have been moved to say, is there some way we can reach a settlement with Japan, but not let anyone know it was a settlement, similar to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if, for example, the Japanese, the Japanese offer, initial offer, there's, there's some evidence the Japanese had offered an, a, a conditional surrender on the basis of the emperor not being deposed. If that, if that offer was still available, then Truman might well have accepted it through a secret deal, you know, non-public, you know, uh, it wouldn't have been public. The American public would have, re would have presented that. Um, but, you know, diplomacy is all about doing things and keeping them secret from the general public. So I could see something like that happening. But the problem is that assumes that the emperor could have even honored such a deal. The, if you recall, when the emperor was announcing surrender, the army almost overthrew him in a coup. So with the American forces on the Japanese home islands and communications more broke down and, and the, the urge to resist that much stronger, I'm not sure if the emperor could have even surrendered if he'd wanted to, even if we offered a good deal. So uh, it's, I, don't see, I don't see that happening. I see it far more likely that Hirohito dies accidentally, is killed, you know, is killed by a random bomb or something, as in the Harry Turtledove novel, novel Joe Steele, where Joseph Stalin, our Joseph Stalin's parents immigrate to America right before uh, he's born, and he's born an American citizen in California and rises through the ranks and eventually becomes president, and uh, through one turn or another, the Japanese, uh, Jap Japan is invaded because we didn't develop the atomic bomb. And we have to fight it out with them. And in that story, the turtle of rights, Hirohito is killed by a, a random American patrol when he's trying to be tra transferred to a safe place. If Hirohito is killed, maybe there's, a, maybe there's a peace. But then again, they might just fight on to the death. So I, th I think it's, uh, it's very unlikely there would have been a peace. But there could have been, it could very well have been that the Japanese might have um, offered to surrender if the Russians had invaded. That's another factor you have to consider too. Without the atomic bombs, the, simply the Russians invading Manchuria and pushing through so fast might have been enough for Japan to offer a surrender at that point. I don't yeah. know, but so it's sort, but of, it's, sort of choosing, cho choosing who they would surrender to and what terms they knew they could get. It, exactly. If the new scholarship is correct, that the Soviet invasion was the main thing that caused the Japanese to surrender, then the presence of an atomic bomb is really not a, if, if in, really not a factor in that, whether or not it's there or not. So Japan, Japan see, you know, no atomic blast, but the Soviets still invade and Japan still offers to surrender to the United States. So it may well have been, as we see through, through so much of our alternative history, that history changes, but it doesn't change that much. There's a, there's a change, but then it quickly bounces back. Um, but I'll, I'll defer to Chris and, and uh, y'all on that. I'd like to hear y'all's thoughts on that. So first, I, I think you did make a very good and very important point about America making this war on the cheap. All told, one figure I saw said the United States in the entire Pacific War lost something like 100,000 troops. That's a bad day in World War I. That is a drop in the bucket. And as horrific as Iwo Jima and Okinawa and everything else was, we we really got off easy. And, and I also, you know, and I think this is something to discuss at a future episode, there's still an emperor of Japan today. Um, while we said we insisted upon unconditional surrender, once they signed, we left the emperor in place. So So I think the you know the possible deal on the table allowing the emperor to stay in 
office is is definitely something worth discussing. Going down this road, um, the one thing I think, yes, if the Soviets do, if it's just a Soviet invasion of the Japanese holdings in Asia first, Manchuria is critical to them. Manchuria in terms of its coal, in terms of its steel, in terms of its industry, that is almost why Japan got into the empire business. So taking that away is very important. And if you do have the Soviet steamroller coming down, I do think the other thing is they're going to take all of Korea. And that is important because if we go down that road, we have the Soviets in Manchuria, Korea. We have the Americans in all of Japan. Let's say, you know, the Soviets are able to take, let's say we have what actually wound up happening. The Soviets take Sakhalin and the Americans take, take, you know, occupy whatever, all of mainland Japan. Soviets are in Korea and we do not have Americans or American allies facing Soviet allies across the 38th parallel. That's important because Northeast Asia is kind of a sideshow. And if that, if Truman isn't able to show his resolve there, maybe the Soviets are testing us in a more critical place. Okay. Randy, thoughts on that? Absolutely. That's a great point. I think that, I think that I, I would give it at least a 40, perhaps 50% chance that the absence of an atomic bomb results in the following. Japan still surrenders, but it's a few days or a week later. And in that time, the Soviets are able to push far enough into Korea that they absorb all of it. And that becomes, and all of Korea falls under the despotism of, the, of Kim Il-sung and his descendants. And the rest, of his, the rest of history remains largely the same as far as the borders. However, that has enormous implications uh, going forward. Um, the, Jap the, uh, the Soviets would not have been able to stage an invasion of the Japanese home islands in time for the surrender. Uh, but the, there's no Korean War, which has significant, uh, huge implica uh, implications, not just the American lives that were spared that would not have been lost in that war. Many of the folks listening will have had family who served in that war, and possibly relatives who passed away in it, uh, passed away who were killed in it. Um, so that's a huge factor. And just the repercussions of the Korean War, the effects it had on Truman's second term, the effects it had on Americans' perception of the, of the, the Cold War. Uh, and like you say, perhaps the biggest thing is that the Soviets testing us in some other place, although it's um, the, the, so the invasion of South Korea by North Korea was is believed to have been pr uh, prompted mostly by the American, uh, the reading of the uh, of Henry L. of, no, no, Henry, of uh, Dean Acheson's speech, where he said that he they ex he excluded uh, Korea from America's uh, sphere of defensive influence in a speech he gave, coupled with so the uh, communist takeover in China. So, without those factors in place, it's quite possible there wouldn't have been any kind of confrontation around 1950 in East Asia or anywhere else, and which would have probably led to uh, possibly an entirely different president in 1952 because um, America being, you know, Eisenhower being less needed to end the war and such, it might well have been that Robert Taft had become president, particularly if there was no war. If, there, if, the, if the Soviet threat was seen as less dangerous in terms of a military sense in a hot war, Robert Taft might have won the Republican nomination since he was more, uh, he, he was less prone to being for involvement in foreign wars. He might have become president and died within a year. So whoever his vice president was, Richard Nixon, William Nolan, Douglas MacArthur would have become president. Um, so a fully communist Korea would have had a huge implication. Not, and, not, and not to mention this, think about all the Korean people who live in the United States today, virtually none of them would be in this country today because without the the freedom to travel the freedom to immigrate in that south korea has you know the without if the soviets had taught, conquered south korea and unified it under one communist dictatorship you and i probably would have never will have never met a korean person in our lives 
because they're all they're all under the the tyranny of the hermit kingdom. Yeah. So yeah. think about think about all the advance and all the think about all the advances that South Korea has brought to the world. All the technologies that developed, the manufacturing, you know, their first world status, all that disappears. And mil and millions of South Koreans aren't even born because of the starvation and the, you know, the quality of life being so much lower. There are tens of millions of South Koreans who won't even be born. So from the point of view of South Korea, uh, this turn in history, uh, you know, the atomic bomb may have been a moral dilemma for the United States, but it saved tens of millions of South Korean lives. Yeah, that, that, that immediately also kicks in another thing to me is I'm now thinking about, you know, the rest of the Asian continent there and how it plays out. What difference does this make in the short term and long term uh, situation with China? Uh, you know, we've talked about Japan, we've talked about, you know, uh, what goes on in the on the Korean on the Korean peninsula, the fact that there may not be a Korean conflict. I mean, in, in the short term, what is different about China as a result of either of these situations that we've talked about, but, you know, ha having just a different way that it plays out there because of the bombing, either of you on that. I, uh, I think maybe China is where the Soviets wind up testing the United States. Um, I think first and foremost, because they occupy Manchuria, I read a very interesting article saying that Right after the war, in that immediate chaos, the nationalist Chiang Kai-shek sent a lot of forces into Manchuria to try and hold all that valuable industry. And because he overextended himself there, he was not able to really fight in more southern parts of China. And, and that could have – that overextension really could have led to – his eventual expulsion to Taiwan. Um, the other thing I'm thinking about is who is the Chinese communist leader? I don't think it's Mao. Um, if you look at the communist world of the 1950s, there are two people that stand up to the Soviet Union. One of them is Tito in Yugoslavia. One of them is Mao. And both of those people came to power on their own. Um, the Soviet Union in China, even in the 30s, in Operation Z, was arming and supplying the nationalist forces. In our timeline, Mao, to a large extent, was able to come to power almost on his own. And I think if you have a full Soviet occupation of Manchuria, First, Chiang Kai-shek isn't able to extend himself, so maybe he consolidates more in southern China, but also internal disputes within the Chinese Communist Party probably come out against Mao and a pro-Russian faction takes over. That's a very interesting thought. I had not, I had not considered that. Uh, that Mao would have lost to power in the Communist Party, given his strength at that point, having led them for so many years. But that's a, that's a very interesting thought. The I have read that the American attempt to negotiate a co coalition between Mao and Chiang when Marsh, George Marshall was sent over there in 1945, I believe, um, was a critical factor in giving the communists time to prepare to, for the inevitable Civil War reopening had Chang not basically held off because the Americans insisted and they had the wherewithal to insist with the financial aid that were given him. If they basically had unleashed him to do what he wanted to do, which was destroy Mao and his and the communists, it might well have been the case that, um, that he would have been successful and that Mao would have been either killed or forced into exile in, in uh, Russian uh, Mongolia or in the Soviet Union itself. And China would be, uh, would have been a, a nationalist, you know, run by the nationalist regime, uh, which would have changed, you know, but particularly now that we see the effect of China as a global power for the last decade or so, a truly global power, uh, that would have had huge repercussions on, uh, on history as well. And I'm inclined to think that Soviet control of Korea would not have necessarily changed the situation in China that much. Uh, affected the outcome, except to the extent that if the Soviets 
we're more determined to hold on in Manchuria. Mao, I mean, that Chiang may not have invaded, you know, pushed up there, which would have meant that he was stronger in the South, so he might well have been able to hold on. Also, perhaps South Korea, if South Korea was occupied by the Soviet Union, it might have made the U.S. more inclined to, to support Chiang. But I'm honestly not I'm not as familiar with the turning points of the Chinese Civil War as I am, say, with our own Civil War. So I'd have to defer to others on that. I'm not as, you know, we all know, all American, you know, historians, you know, his, you know, history buffs know about Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Antietam, Little Round Top, Pickett's Charge, such as that. Um, but we're not as, I'm not as familiar with the Little Round Tops and the Pickett's Charges of the Chinese Civil War. So I have to defer to others on that. And I'm not the person you're going to be able to defer to there, Brent. So, uh, Brent, so maybe, you know, m maybe Chris can go that route. But certainly, I, I think it is a fair thing to say that it, the implications are obviously not just three way in terms of how this would have played out for the end of the war. There's, there's the American implication, the Japanese implication, we've already mentioned the Russian Soviet implication, but there's the broader uh, Asian continental implications because that, that's the theater that this is happening in. So, China being a big player there something's going to be different about China. So trying to figure out what that is, you know, is, is one of the interesting what ifs in my mind is, especially given where we stand now today, you know, you know uh, so far removed from it in terms of the relative power positions of uh, the Chinese as a player on the world scene. Do they, do they rise to that position earlier, later, in a different way, you know, nationalists versus the communists? If you make some changes there, that has tremendous potential ripple effects, certainly down to our modern day history. For sure. If you project, if you if you project Taiwan onto China, and that which is not you can't entirely do because it's one thing to industrialize a small island; it's another to industrialize a billion people. But if you if you take the standard of living and the economic wealth and GDP of Ta of Taiwan, and add ten and subtract ten years from it, and then project that onto China, China is going to be rich much richer sooner and it's going to be in an interesting position because it's an enemy it's it's opposed to the soviet union so it's our ally but at some point particularly after the soviet union falls there's going to be a point where china because Ch chang had was suspicious of america you know he was he wasn't an you know a, a Amer an amerophile he, he had his suspicions of america just as he had the soviet union so at some point, China decides to start going its own way, and it's richer. You know, it, it's it's not as monstrous as the regime in China in, uh, in Beijing is now, but the government in Peking or Nanking would still be very nationalistic, prone to expansion. So, and on top of that, they would have a lot more people, a lot more smart people, because they wouldn't have exterminated their professors and their leading intellectuals and their you know, they're smart people, anybody with talent and independent thought during the purges of the Maoist era. So China would be richer, smarter, more populous, and uh, and they would be a very strong competitor to us. They would be in some ways like America became to the British Empire, um, although less less friendly. You know, not as unfriendly as China is today, but certainly, you know, less inclined, you know, certainly less friendly than we are to the British because you know, they don't share a common language or history with us. And also the Han Chinese, the Han Chinese are not exactly egalitarian when it comes to their view of the world and their view of other peoples, you know, <laughs> they're, yeah, they, there's them and then there's everybody else. So it's a, their, their worldview in terms of the hierarchy of peoples is far more in line with the views of people of a certain central European political party in the 1930s. Uh, than it is with our egalitarian notions of today. I'll, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, Chris, any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I actually see so, a couple of European corollaries here. I I see Chang as almost the Asian de Gaulle that we, uh, you know, we're allied with him. We I absolutely help him. agree with that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he he comes into power in China, but he's a little prickly about it. Um, he, you know, I, I'm my, reminded of uh, a history teacher I had who was in the United States Marine Corps in France during the 60s when uh, de Gaulle pulled the United States 
or pulled France out of the NATO structure. And they came in and had to account for all the toilet seats that were taken out. Uh, I, I could see a, a Chang's China acting very much like that, acting, you know, accepting a Marshall Plan to industrialize, to really develop, but, but being a little nose in the air about it. Um, the other European corollary I'm thinking about is Germany, in that I don't see a scenario in this counterfactual where the Soviets do not maintain some form of control over Manchuria, maybe extending down into northeastern China and the Beijing area. And what would happen playing out everything else and you know we've gone down a, I, I realize there's a lot else going on here but um i'm thinking about the german scenario of reunification after the fall of the soviet union assuming it does you have a southern china which i think i agree with how brant laid it out it is very well developed it is very modern and you have a northern china which is the corollary in this case to East Germany. Um, so you would have Southern China out of, you know, ethnic brotherhood wanting to reintegrate these former Soviet Chinese areas. The one interesting thing is Manchuria itself is Manchu, not necessarily Han. So maybe they don't take as, maybe they don't integrate that as well. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, but I do think that to understand what the scenario we're talking about, both the De Gaulle and, and German reunification, and also thinking about how much it took monetarily and financially for even just a smaller example of this to happen in the case of Germany, how much money West Germany had to commit to reintegrate with East Germany. And by the way, there are still pretty deep economic divisions you can see inside that country. So and, I, poli and political divisions too. The alternative for Deutschland party, for example, is very popular uh, in Eastern, the Eastern portions of the country that used to be the East Germany, but has almost no support in what is, what was West Germany. It's absolutely. a whole different, and you know, they're, they're perceived as being more nationalistic and, anti-socialist and anti-immigration and that point of view is more in line with the people who were occupied by by communists for 40 years than the more liberal and open western part of the country because communist countries are nationalistic they are prone to you know they are prone to being opposed to outsiders but also having been under the thumb against their will of the soviets they're all west germans are also i mean east germans are more prone to be anti-socialist you know anti what they perceive as communists or outsiders forcing it in on because the, the AFD paints the image of, well, it's outsiders forcing this on you. It's globalist institutions. It's the EU that's forcing you to take these people. And that strikes a nerve with East Germans who see, you know, a corollary to the Soviet Union with their tanks holding the Germans down. It's not like they wanted to be in the Warsaw Bloc. They had to be in it. And, and one other thought I have thinking about a little bit further back in um, Chinese history, the last emperor, the last imperial system of China was the Qing Dynasty. They were not Han. They were Manchus from Manchuria. And so I could see a little bit of what you're talking about, Brant, with a revanchalist idea of the Manchu Dynasty was destroyed by Westerners, was destroyed by the foreign invaders. And it led to this period of anarchy where everyone else is coming in and taking over China. And finally, we're coming back after the Soviets are finally kicked out. And this really possibly a nasty form of nationalism, revangelism up in northeastern China. So, so if I were to summar, summarize a lot of what I heard there, it's, you could almost imagine a we think North Korea, South Korea today, just expand that out to being these much more massive, much more populous, you know, North and South China, so to speak, scenario. Uh, and then, you know, we, we brought in the parallels there of East and West Germany before the unification. Are, are those 
those are both those are similar parallels and different parallels so that you sort of see that potentially playing out as a I'll just think of it as a, a north south china slash you know equivalent of a north south korea slash east west germany is that sort of what we're talking about here just on a much grander and more more involved scale if we just try to summarize it pretty much yes you also have to remember that if china were divided roughly along you know divided in half that the south chinese part uh the southern china although it would not have the historic some of the historic Han areas would be far more ethnically Han. If you look at a map of China today in the provinces, all, the, all of the South China provinces, with the exception of three over towards Hunan, are 90% or more ethnically Han. And even the Hunan areas are about 80% ethnically Han. So on the other hand, in North China, you have up to around Peking, you have a very you have 95% plus Han, but after that, you go into Manchuria, the, the density of Han grows lower, Inner Mongolia, and certainly Xinjiang and Tibet. Tibet probably would stay independent in this timeline because they'd be allied with the, uh, South China, but upper Ch the North China would be far more like the Soviet Union in that it's, it's, it's less homogenous and has different groups that are uh, going to be trying to rebel the Uyghurs and such so you could see a lot of the atrocities which the communists are commit, uh, committing now being done earlier to hold them in place without that ethnic Han core that that Mao could pull on all the way from Hong Kong to Peking Peking with only half of that or less than half the he might have had to rule with far more he would have been less efficient less united and far more uh, prone to um, to having to be more repressive but uh, yeah, but yeah, it, 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 it's interesting. That's the, although I will say in all, this has been very interesting thought experiment, but I will say that I am somewhat prone to be, you know, sometimes a small change in history has huge impacts, but typically history tends to close in behind it and keep on marching forward. So I'm a bit skeptical as to whether or not the absence of an atomic bomb means a divided China or a nationalist China. I'd like yeah. to think it does, but I'm more inclined to believe Soviets could push through and take the rest of Korea, um, assuming they even do that. That might not even be the case. It just depends on how long Japan decides to not surrender. If they hold off for two weeks or a month, yeah, they take it. But if they hold off just another five days, probably not. So it might well have been that the whole history, you know, the history moved forward almost unchanged. Um, I would like to uh, talk for a minute, though, about and uh, get y'all's thoughts on this as well. I'm sure y'all can bring a lot of personal insight to this as well. Um, I'd like to talk about the implications of an American invasion of Japan because it, while I don't think, I, I, while I don't think that was likely, um, yeah, I think the most likely scenario is Japan still surrenders anyway, albeit a few days or a week or two later. Uh, it, if we did invade Japan think about the casualties that we would have suffered even if it had even if it was much lower the, the million casualties you know 200,000 dead 800,000 wounded let's say it was only it was half of that think about all the americans who were subsequent leaders of our country who had been involved in that operation or think about your parents your father or grandfather or uncle who was in the pacific theater or was in europe and would have been almost certainly transferred to the pacific theater given the huge numbers of men we would have needed and, you know, his odds of surviving or not. I just think about just a few names of Americans who would have probably been in the thick of that. The most prominent being George H.W. Bush. He was training to be a pot to uh, serve as, as a, in the Naval and the uh, Naval Air Forces that were going to be part of that invasion of Japan. Realistically, if you were on a ship or in the Air Force, you were probably less likely to be killed than if you were on the ground. But it's not outside of the realm of probability that, uh, or possibility that George H.W. Bush, had we invaded Japan, might have been killed. His plane might have been shot down and he might have been killed and the whole Bush dynasty died with him right there before it was even born. Spiro Agnew was, a officer, uh, was an officer in Europe, during, uh, an infantry officer in Europe during World War II. He might well have found himself in Japan, and if he had been killed, history takes a massive turn there. Barry Goldwater was a transportation Air Force pilot flying over the Himalayas. 
he might have found himself transferred to Japan. And who knows, you know, Senator John Tower, the first Republican senator since the Reconstruction days in Texas, sort of the founder of the modern Texas GOP, he, um, he was also a, a also in the Pacific Theater. Um, Strom Thurmond was had a distinguished military record in Europe and could very well have found himself in the Pacific. Perhaps the most interesting of all, Richard Nixon was an op was working in Washington at the time, but he might, uh, but he could very well have tried if the war proceeded in 46, could have gotten himself transferred if he wanted to, to the Pacific. But probably the most likely scenario, Robert F. Kennedy was 20 years old when Japan surrendered. He was not quite 20 actually, but the Joseph Kennedy Jr. was a naval ship and destroyer, I believe that was commissioned in early 46. Imagine him, the war dragging on to 46, him applying and wanting to go and serve because his brother's death affected him greatly, be getting himself assigned as an ensign to that destroyer, which his father certainly could have arranged for him. Imagine that destroyer being in the Japanese waters, do, you know, serving as part of that effort. Imagine a scenario where a Japanese mine, Japanese suicide bomber, whatever, you know, I mean, a, you know, kamikaze plane sinks that destroyer and kills Ensign Robert F. Kennedy. So, and those are just some of the names. You know, right. they, you, George, you, you, George you, liter you, liter George you literally could, you know, easily probably because of the influence after that, uh, all those that served, you could go down and probably find, you know, 10 to 15,000 prominent Americans in terms of prominent being, having held, you know, national, local, uh, statewide offices. <laughs> Not to mention, yeah. you know, leaders in industry, you know, getting outside of politics there very quickly, leaders in industry Precisely. and other things as well. Where, where if you're how, that, Howard, Howard how, Baker, how would that be Howard different, Baker, right? Exactly. Howard Baker, John Conley, John Anderson, who ran as a third party candidate in 1980, all these men were in the middle, were in the service and were either in the Pacific or would have likely been transferred to the Pacific. And the most famous name, you know, Kennedy, Nixon. I mean, these are, and the odds are, given the number of Americans who died. And that's the other thing too. The odds are they would have survived, but if they were in the infantry, given the huge casualties expected, they, there's a good chance, 50-50 chance that they would have probably been wounded and at least a 10% you know, chance they would have been killed. So you take 10 prominent Americans who, were, who would have been in the infantry and would have likely served in the infantry. One of them is gonna die. You just don't know which one it is. And here's the even crazier part. Think about all the Americans, politicians, statesmen, business leaders today, who were born between 1946 and say 1960. How many of their fathers would have ended up in Japan as infantrymen? And if they had been killed, Steve Jobs, I don't know what Steve Jobs' father was doing during World War II, Bill Gates, uh, Bill Clinton, you know, the, the list goes on. You know, Donald, well, Donald Trump's father wasn't in the Pacific, but just think about the, the list goes on. Hillary Clinton's, you know, was born in 1948. You know, I don't know what her father was doing during the war, but just think about the implications, the implications of a massive American death toll in, or in Japan. Uh, the ripple effects throughout history are just incredible. It's like, it's like, it's like I a agree. meteor striking the Pacific. Yeah, I agree. And you know, one of the interesting things that even ties back to our uh, to our original premise here is actually, you know, connecting back, you know, small changes in who the casualties are during a war. We're talking about a decision here in the real timeline that was made by President Truman, who was who fought during the First World War. <laughs> um, and in fact, uh, w w when you read the biography, I think particularly of McCullough's biography of Truman, uh, you come to realize a lot of the character of who Harry Truman is was formed by uh, his his exposure uh, to circumstances and to the pressures of leadership during the First World War. Imagine that he's a casualty in the First World War. So the person that's even making this decision, we say that they don't have, or a different decision about whether to invade or not, is somebody other than Truman, because Truman doesn't exist as we know him, because he was killed in the First World War. You know, again, it's those small, those those are not small things, but when you when you realize the, a single casualty, the impact that it might have, there may have been someone that's just like that individual that comes along and you know becomes that individual. We know that that can happen, but I think you make an excellent point there, Brent. Is that you know, uh, and I totally agree with what you guys said. You know, you don't want to think of 100,000 lives as being on the cheap, but when you look at it comparatively <laughs> to the other uh, the other nations during World War II, the United States suffered, relatively speaking, 
a very low percentage of casualties. And uh, the other thing that immediately comes to mind, because you made the mention there, Brent, talking about, you know, the American Civil War, particularly thinking about the way that military companies were organized during that war. Um, I remember this distinctly from Ken Burns' Civil War. I guess it was Shelby Foote talking about this. You know, whole towns lost all of their young men because that, that regiment got into a bad place in a battlefield, you know, where, where there was just an absolute, you know, loss of, of everyone. If you can imagine just some of the ways that everyday life would have been impacted by, you know, some some small towns in the United States that that had a large number of their young men that were over that would have been committed to this invasion where 80% of them don't come back, would those towns have even still existed? So it's not even just talking about, you know, the individual impacts on politics or business, or obviously the impacts on family, but even the impacts on not the big macro picture of U.S. history, but in my mind, the mi the micro picture of some parts of U.S. history could have been impacted as well. Chris, any thoughts on that? I, I completely agree that, I mean, we, we're getting into some pretty weird territory. <laughs> From where we started, we've, about, got to a, we've got to a strange just, place, right? <laughs> just literally, like, looking at anybody, any famous American between, like, 1945 and into the 19, early 90s, and like, well, or do you make it? Um, the, the other interesting thing I'm thinking about, and, and one of the nice things about this initial fork was, again, the bombs are delayed, but they still exist. And so with our looking at what happens in the world, I, I think off podcast, when you and I were talking, I said, it may have been a good thing that the United States was able to test and demonstrate a willingness to use them in a limited capacity after at the end of World War II. Um, because in, in thinking about this, I've kind of been building around a little bit of my family history. My grandfather was a European infantryman who was offered a promotion and transfer to go to Japan and would have been able to go home and see my father who was born in 43 for the first time. That's one question, but the other question, my father being born in 43, was serving on a U.S. Air Force base in Suffolk County, Long Island, um, in October of 1962. And if we don't have the example of what happens when nuclear weapons start flying, how safe is is that? Right. Well, and, and you know, the other thing that, that pops into my head, and we have ranged far, actually, for, we've ranged in an area I didn't expect to go to in further afield than, than I thought we would. But uh, again, just to, we, we all have some personal connection, you know, indirectly to the scenario here. So the, the, the instance that Brent brings up, I think resonates for all of us. We can see it in, in major figures as well. But I'm glad you brought us back to the original premise of the what if, which is not that we've eliminated this as an option. We've just changed the timing on this as an option. And uh, one of the things that immediately jumps in, about, there's two things I wanna really explore here just to sort of pull us back a little bit closer to the original Fork, although I've liked the other places that we've gone, which is if you only ever have the, the theoretical understanding because you've seen the test conducted, but back to what Brant mentioned earlier about, you know, the actual impacts of using a nuclear weapon in terms of how it's different than what is in some ways instantaneously equally as destructive through regular conventional firebombing, for example, but if you've never actually had it tested in in war, where you actually see that impact, you know what it's like to then go to Hiroshima or Nagasaki after it's been dropped and understand the additional remnant effect of that. So if you never have it used as it was in World War II, so there's just the threat of it, do you think that changes the calculus of how it works in the Cold War in terms of somebody maybe being more willing uh, to use a nuclear weapon than, you know, both sides had them. For example, you mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis earlier there, Brant. You know, we, we came, everything I read now, particularly as more information comes out, we came really close there to a lot of things. But there was every effort being made to not go there because there was the recollection that was there, and by this point we had far more powerful weapons, was Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If you don't have that, does that change the likelihood of what would have happened with a future nuclear exchange just because there hadn't been one before. And open that up to either one of you that may have some thoughts on that. Um, I think it does. It, in looking at 
the in invention of the kind of artillery that Harry Truman was using and uh, the machine gun at the turn of the 20th century. So many people looked at that kind of technology and I think Hiram Maxim, the inventor of the machine gun, you know, got, got going on it because somebody suggested that if you can invent a machine that'll let Europeans kill each other more efficiently. Uh, there was always this idea of Gatling. I think when he invented his gun, he wanted to make a weapon so terrible that it would make war irrelevant, make sustained World War II style conflict between nations impossible. And I think the example of having seen Hiroshima and Nagasaki drove home that we might have reached that point. And if we don't have it, I don't know that we do have that sense of we do need to pull things back. Uh, very much thinking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, I think at the beginning of this I talked about uh, a tourist attraction in Las Vegas used to be above ground nuclear test. Well, the Cuban Missile Crisis stopped that. Um, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, we realized how close we, be, we came, and Kennedy and Khrushchev made an effort to pull back. And I think the atomic weapons being used did make, did give not just leaders, but people a sense of we need to be very, very careful. And I think without that example, you can't really see the Cold War staying cold as long as it did. Brent, any thoughts on that? I'm inclined to agree. Okay. So then my other question is, if we, you know, one of the things that always struck me, I guess, so particularly as, as, as a younger individual, not really fully grasping this, because of the way that the actual surrender of Japan goes down, and we've suggested here maybe something similar, just with a different motivation for that surrender. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about the Soviet involvement, but the as most most listeners of the podcast know anybody who knows me personally is I'm, I'm a big baseball fan and uh, so i'm actually happy you know finally to actually have i don't know if it's going to play its way out with what's going on with the, the pandemic and how it plays out from this but i'm happy to have baseball back but for example japan adopts a lot of american culture very quickly um after the war during the occupation as part of the occupation we introduce things there as Americans in, into, into, that, um, into that culture. And, but a lot of that you know, carries on and endures in that culture there. It's hard for me to imagine a similar type of situation with a, uh, I'll just use this distinction to describe the two different things, with a defeated Japan versus a surrendered Japan, if you understand the difference there. So I guess how would things be different, assuming again, there's going to be an allied victory of the war, which I think is a fair assumption. We've talked about the impact on U.S. resolve to suffer the casualties and continue to suffer the casualties to carry that through to the air to the end. But what's the difference in a defeated Japan versus a surrendered Japan, and how does that play out? Um, they would be less likely to certainly, I think Chris and I would agree, it would be far less likely that they would um, take to American culture in ways uh, it would take much longer for that to be the case. We would be viewed more like we are viewed in Iraq or Afghanistan, even even worse, in fact, uh, than we were viewed. It was really quite providential and miraculous the way the Japanese occupation turned out, um, in large part due to the wise decisions that the uh, that Douglas MacArthur made as the de facto shogun of Japan. Um, but a, an invasion of Japan would have retarded that progress by decades, perhaps indefinitely. I, I agree, kind of hearkening back to an earlier episode I was on about the Mongol invasion of Japan. Um, it's a very unique culture and we were very lucky both in the acquiescence of Hirohito and the decisions made by MacArthur that it was a blending that they were susceptible they were open to um american influence and involvement and i think if you don't have that if you have the united states coming in and knocking down doors and you know the 
certain guerrilla warfare that would have happened in Japan, not only do you not have that happy blending, but you also have probably a re revanchist Japan that not only is the United States having to occupy, but it's occupying on a long term and in a very different, under very different conditions than we are currently, you know, we still have troops in Japan. We still have troops in Germany, but they're under very different conditions. I agree that that, that was the mental place that I was going is that, you know, would, uh, what are we granted that we're what, <laughs> wow, we're almost 70, we're 75 plus years removed uh, from, from the end of the war there. W would there still be an, not just a U.S. presence, as you well point out there, Chris. There's a there's a United States presence militarily and otherwise in Japan, but but that's a, that's not an occupation. Would we still be in some form of occupation? And then the, the, the other part of that is, you know, Japan, which had been devastated by the war. I mean, you know, uh, Grant made made references earlier to the the impacts of of, con of conventional bombing uh, just on Japan. Japan had to be rebuilt. Uh, but I think it's fair to say, and, and correct me if you think differently, it didn't have to be rebuilt in anything remotely resembling how it would have had to be rebuilt had there actually been uh, the carrying out of Operation Downfall and the various elements of that. The, the rebuilding effort, just in rebuilding Japan, would have been another order of magnitude, probably more involved and costly, not to mention you know, what that would have meant for occupation versus surrender. I, I think if the United States has to invade Japan, its rebuilding strategy is the Morgenthau Plan. Um, Morgenthau Plan was put forward by Henry Morgenthau, a U.S., uh, I believe, Secretary of the Treasury for Germany, in that they would go into Germany and make it pastoral, completely deindustrialize the country. And while you know that was deci not decided on in the case of a Germany, I think in the case of Japan, the fact that they did industrialize, the fact that they had developed and didn't have any natural resources of their own was such a cause of the war, was such a cause of Japan expanding out and, for the lack of a better phrase, causing trouble in Asia, that maybe pastoralization where you get to a Japan that can actually feed itself and doesn't need to go out and externally take resources from its neighbors, that may actually be the route we go down. So maybe we don't see much rebuilding. Maybe we see debuilding. Okay. You have any thoughts the, on that, Brent? Yeah, the, the the problem with that would have been this would have been even worse than the problem with the Morgenthau plan and why it was abandoned. As I recall, Roosevelt was open to the idea, although he entertained ideas all the time by his subordinates, which he never really had any, uh, any particular desire to, uh, to continue with, and certainly not the, the follow through. Ro Roosevelt, Roosevelt wasn't the most hardworking of politicians. You know, he, he, he didn't have the, the grit and drive of, say, a Nixon or LBJ. So, and when Churchill revolted against the idea because he understood the enormous amount of Germans who would die from starvation, it would have been even worse in Japan. Uh, in order to, imp to bring a Morgenthau plan to Japan or to Germany, it would have resulted in the deaths of millions of Germans from starvation because they were just overpopulated to be an agricultural society. And at some point that would have dawned on the Americans and, and we wouldn't have gone through with it. Um, certainly there were people in America who felt as revengeous and vindictive toward Germany as many uh, rank and file Americans felt toward Japan. But when the prospect of millions of dead people is, you know, staring, in, staring you in the face, uh, I, I think that that plan would have been abandoned and they would have, and something, another approach would have had to been taken, particularly if Japan was turning into another Malaysia or another Vietnam with a stubborn uh, guerrilla resistance that just wouldn't go away. I mean, think about how hard it was for us. All, granted, the, the chi without Chinese and Russian help, the North Vietnamese couldn't have maintained their effort. But even if we had isolated the island, imagine Japan with a 20-year insurgency. 
which every week a couple hundred Americans are killed or seriously wounded in the occupation of Japan, eventually that would have resulted in us having to make some kind of hearts and minds approach. Uh, you know, the, the old joke in the military about, we're gonna do hearts and minds approach today, boys, two to the chest and one to the head. Eventually that would have had to give way to a more, uh, you know, more carrot and less stick approach. So uh, I, doubt, I doubt they would have followed through with the Morgan Fall plan. Well, my, my question about the scenario you just outlined is, and I like it, um, you mentioned the possibility, and we might have gone a little far from that, of a, of a Taft presidency in 52. Um, if the United States decides to stay in Japan, that's one thing. Maybe we are looking at that 20-year um, you know, slow drain on American morale and manpower. But at, at what point do you think that leads to a Taft presidency and a U.S. cutting Japan loose? Indeed, and indeed. Well, if you look at the most, if you look at the most likely scenario, Japan does surrender before we invade because of the Soviets. But with Korea not in the picture, it could very well be that that helps. Um, that that will help Taft become president and have a general de-escalation around the world. You know, Eisenhower did not have any wars during his presidency and did a, a very good job, I think, of managing the, of setting the tone, really, for what would be the Cold War for the next 40 years. But you see, with Taft, you would have seen all the same, all the same uh, de-escalation and perhaps even more. But given that, the, given that what we're talking about, about presupposes an American land invasion in Japan, I still, based on my reading of history, I'm still not, I'm still not satisfied that that would have been what would have happened. The Soviet factor is too big a factor in my mind. I still think they would have, they would have offered some kind of deal or surrendered outright before a land invasion would have occurred. Um, and I don't know, I'm not familiar enough with the impacts. You know, my specialty is American political history, but the, the effects of not having the, us in Korea are, are, are a bit too, I haven't quite thought that out to be able to say that would have most likely led to Robert Taft beating Eisenhower at the 52 convention. It almost certainly would have helped Harry Truman to not have a war in Korea. He would have been able to focus more on domestic policy and uh, the problems that he had in Korea would have, he still was planning to retire, but he might well have delayed that announcement until later and that would have had a lot of implications on the Democratic primary. Plus, of course, Brett, the biggest legacy of Korea and a lot of people's thinking is, uh, in addition to the live save, is the Douglas Macar the MacArthur Truman feud, you know, never flares up. MacArthur probably retires around the same time he did in, in, re in real life, 1951, as the U.S. commander in Japan and then comes home to America and you know, he probably and retires into quiet, you know, you know, quiet retirement. But uh, there's certainly no massive flair at the end of his career. No Inchon, no, he would have gotten a great welcome when he got home, but it would have been none of the passion that stirred on both sides. It would have been more of a, a hero's retirement from World War II rather than a political football that it became. So that's, uh, that's another factor as well. MacArthur would have probably been viewed much more sympathetically by modern historians. Um, although his, 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 it's been said of MacArthur, his problem was he was the most brilliant man in the room. He knew it and everyone knew it. And they all knew that he knew that they knew it. And he, he or not put another way, he refused to hide his light under a bushel. He lacked Eisenhower's gift for pretending to be less than he was. Eisenhower was also a brilliant man. Uh, uh, manager of men, but he understood that people like to think that they're doing you a favor. So Eisenhower pretended to be less than he was in order to cultivate people. Whereas MacArthur believed in basically the ancient, you know, the ancient principle of leadership, which is demonstrate your superiority to all the other tribesmen, and then they will kind of bow to your superiority and follow you because you're obviously the best man to lead them. But in modern times, that's, uh, that's far less attractive. Modern warfare has made it easier 
for men of, of lesser brilliance to succeed and therefore brilliant men don't have to be tolerated with all their egoism. So. I think that's an interesting take, you know, just per personalities are personalities. It's hard to take those personalities out, but what you just described there is the perception of a personality could have been different because of different circumstances that would have made, uh, you know, there were, there were, there were people that favored MacArthur for the reason they favored MacArthur. As I understand that period of history, there were those who had the opinion of him because of, the way that he clashed with Truman, for example. Well, if you remove that, those people don't, may not have that opinion of him. And so they may have appreciated more the things that they would have appreciated and not seen the negative things that were there. You know, the other thing that, that jumps out at me, and again, we, we can literally, this is why probably this will come back to be episodes that will have in the future. And I'd love to have both of you back on this because you've laid the groundwork for this. But, you know, the other thing that runs in my mind thinking about that scenario where there's a, you know, the, the occupation of Japan. And again, the question there is, I don't have thoughts on that. I don't know if that's a, if that's a couple of years, if that's a decade, if that, you know, lasts for multiple decades. I think the, the length of time varies what it is and how it impacts history. But, you know, if, if something we alluded to earlier that, that really jumps into my head is if you have U.S. military might, manpower, attention and focus that's, that's having to maintain an occupation in Japan, whatever form that occupation is taking, as other things are popping up around the world as part of the traditional Cold War, how do you deal with and resolve the fact that you have, you know, some of your capabilities that are, that are occupied there in Japan that can't go and be elsewhere if they need to be, you know, so what happens in, when other scenarios pop up, and we've talked about this before, the testing uh, by the by the Soviets and the Cold War may have happened in other parts of the world. How do you have to make tough decisions at some point about not being able to do what you want to do in Japan because uh, you have to go and move troops to some other place, or do you make the decision uh, that you, the the opposite of that, which is that you can't go and do other things because you've occupied troops and forces there in Japan? Absolutely, a YouTube channel, um, Alternative History Hub has made something that really speaks to what you're talking about, about Korea. And I think that's the most fascinating part about all of this. The, the, the real world changing point of divergence from our timeline here is Japan's is not the Japanese surrender or the occupation of Japan. That probably changes very little, but with no Korean war, with the Soviets in con conquering all of Korea means some real changes in world history because no Korean war and all the uh, YouTube channel, like I said, Alternative History Hub has made some some fascinating videos about that. Short little videos. One, if what if South Korea had won the war, uh, which of course wouldn't apply here, and the other, what if North Korea had won the war, or a better one, what if Korea was united today under the, the com a communist regime? And there are some significant changes in world history, and I'm uh, because of the. Of just a number of factors. So I think that our world would have changed a great deal, not necessarily in the short term, but in but five years later, the, the impacts of history of not having the Korean War would have been massive going forward, particularly from the point of view of the United States being more inclined to use force to resist the Soviet Union. Without having had a, the Korean War, I think the American public would have been more inclined to fight the Soviets in a someplace else with a hot war instead of a cold war. And I think, Chris, this goes back to what you were talking about. So I think we'd be in agreement on that. The, the one thing I'd point out is I think we need to think about the importance of the Korean War as a trial, as waking the United States up. While the United States may have been more willing to confront the Soviet Union somewhere else in the world, the advantage of the Korean War is that it showed the United States you know what, you're not going to be able to use your air force to win every single war. So that led to a bit of a development of conventional forces that gave the United States the ability to confront the Soviet Union elsewhere, which if we're going back to our scenario where we've got this wonderful secret weapon that nobody knows about, and we were able to bring Japan down with just air power, as the American narrative would go, um, Maybe the United States doesn't develop that full spectrum capability to confront the Soviet Union in a still a conventional struggle somewhere, but maybe we don't have that capacity because going in, you know, at the beginning of Korea, we didn't. And the experience of Korea 
taught the United States a lot. I think that's true. We're, you know, we're again, in my mind, it's a little bit of the same thing I asked about earlier, which is uh, what are we inclined or not inclined to do potentially in terms of using nuclear weapons without the actual experience of them? If you don't have the actual experience of more conditional conflict or conventional conflict in Korea and then the other places that are there, your, 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 your mindset is also going to be altered about what you either can or will do or what you think you can do. You know, I'm always, I, I use this adage a lot, even in the business world, you know, it, it seems to be, because it's true, generals always seem to be fighting the last war, right? <laughs> Only to discover that something has changed, perhaps in a major way in terms of uh, warfare and strategic and or tactical thinking. And if you have a successful United States, even if there is the need for a military invasion of Japan, and that's how that's resolved there, either quickly because of the, uh, a quick surrender, or even if it's extended, you know, I've heard the, the horror scenarios of a one or two year period of time to, to completely pacify and take control. But your, your experience as the United States is being able to use your military might uh, to be successful. Does that play into the next conflict that you encounter if it's not Korea, but plays in a way that when you go and do that, it has a very different outcome, either positive or negative, just because you, that's what your experience has reinforced that you can and will do. You mentioned, and, and Brant pointed this out, you know, the use of, the use of resources like, uh, like, like naval and, and, and air force resources to fight in such a way that you didn't have to put boots on the ground. Uh, if you've suddenly gone through a scenario where you had to put a large number of boots on the ground, uh, to be able to to do what you need to do in Japan, does that alter how you think about even using that, you know, down the road? Again, I I interesting thoughts in terms of the way that that can all play out, which is all goes back to you know how we know that history gets so so interrelated, and why changing one thing is, which is what this whole podcast is about, can can often have a major repercussion. Or, as Brent said earlier, sometimes history, the force of history, is just so strong you can you can divert it for a little bit, but eventually the other macro forces that are going to go on to bring you to the exact same place, just in a slightly different way. I think we probably hit a good stopping point, at least for the topic today. But before I do that, I do want to at least put out to put out to Chris and Brent, if they have any final thoughts, just on what we've covered so far, just something you've been itching to say that you haven't had a chance to do. But I think it's very likely we will find ourselves scheduling sometime in the coming months, a revisit of this topic, picking it back up and maybe taking it from a slightly different perspective. So Anything that you've been itching to say, Brant, that we didn't get a chance to cover yet? Because we've gone pretty far afield of our original what if, I think in a good way. But uh, we, 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 went off to, we went off to Europe, we went off to other parts of Asia. Uh, for, for a conversation that's about Japan, we didn't spend as much time there probably as we could have. You, we, absolutely. But I think we've established, in my mind, at least a couple of factors. One is that the absence of an atomic bomb in August 1945 would probably not have affected the situation in Japan that much different than what happened in our history. However, it would have very likely have changed the whole map of Korea and the implications would have been felt five years and 10 years down the line, far more and so on, far more in that area and in, the, in world history uh, than in Japan, similar to perhaps to what if a great world leader had died of an, you know, as an infant of, or, you know, what if some famous political figure or general had died as an infant of a, a little, of a childhood disease, the impact on world history wouldn't have been felt for decades until after that, until that person would have risen to military leadership, but didn't because he died as an infant. Nonetheless, the impact is profound. It just takes longer to be felt. And I think that's what we see here in the case of the atom, of no atomic bomb being used on Japan. Yes. Any, any closing thoughts before we come back at some point and reopen this case? Um, I think we've got a lot of a lot of bridges to some future episodes here. I'm really interested. I think I think you mentioned you know you you kind of like a couple of episodes to fill August. I think we've opened enough stuff to maybe fill like this year. Yeah, and one of the, and one of the things you know we try to do here intentionally. Uh, we're we're a young podcast, and again, as I've said so often, we know we're a niche podcast. You know, we're not going to have tens of thousands of listeners here. But one of the things I've tried to do, or Alexis and I have tried to do, it, it is her podcast too. Uh, she she will listen to this episode and be be glad that I reminded her of that. Is uh, I've tried to you know vary around the topics. It's real easy for me. For example, I have a love of, of American history. Brant's love that he expressed there. You know. 
I think you can do a whole alternative history podcast just on the Civil War and run forever, right? Um, on the American Civil War. I mean, literally, there's just Harry, so many. So, Harry, so, Tur- Harry Tittledove, Harry and, Tittledove and, came darn near close. He wrote yeah, he, like 15 he, books. He's, he's, he's made a whole life out of doing that, right? Uh, and I think he's been profitable at doing it. Uh, but, so I do like to try to move around, you know, with, with eras and topics and locations in the world. But I do think this is one of the types of topics that's worth coming back to somewhat frequently in the sense that it's it's relevant. Again, we've already talked about today. We've talked about the United States. We've talked about Japan. We've talked about China. We've talked about the Soviet Union. Obviously, now impacting down to Russia today. It goes pretty far afield there. Um, so so it, it has a wide geographic scope. Uh, because it, it's a seminal event of the 20th century. The World War II is a seminal event leading into the Cold War after that. But the other reason I think it's so compelling is it informs even where we are today. And we spent some time there talking about, you know, how, it, how, is, how is a 2020 China potentially different because of what happens in August of 1945? And that's a real question. And it's relevant then and it's relevant now, I guess is what I'm saying in a long-winded way, which is why coming back to some of the same topics over and over again, I think it's not bad because they are always relevant to where we are today. And I think there's one of the values to me of alternate history and counterfactuals is helping us think through how we got to where we are, (laughs) because the one thing we can do in where we are today, that old adage about history is, if we don't learn from it, we're doomed to repeat it. (laughs) is how can that inform maybe some of the ways that we address the issues that we're dealing with today because we understand better how we got to where we are. Uh, having said that, I do really appreciate again and do value Grant and, and Chris both uh, uh, as being listeners for the show and being active participants in the show. So I appreciate you guys giving some time today uh, to explore this topic and we'll definitely circle back around to it. Uh, I know that I, a couple of things back with Brent, he's a busy guy these days and so I'm trying to recognize he's got a lot going on uh, in his in his personal life and also in his in his other areas of interest in his life to to not want to tap on him too much but uh, Brent has also sent a number of different just scenarios that play off some other things that we're going to get back around to we're going to get back around to pick it up the clay continuum here at some point Brent because I want to go down that path and explore that out in a little more detail too and uh, I know Chris has some other topics that he suggested as well so we'll come back to those so once again, guys, I appreciate you. I appreciate you not just your time today, but I appreciate you overall. And uh, I think our, our audience appreciates having, uh, having, having, being represented by you guys very well as listeners and participants here on the podcast. So I just want to say thank you. And we'll look, look forward to having you on again soon, both individually and collectively. So uh, again, I appreciate it. And, and that sort of brings us to the end of this episode. So I'm going to do what we do. We close out an episode just really quick. And that starts with reminding you that we do have a web page and we invite you to, to go and visit it. That's www.aporkintimepodcast.com. The A is real important there to get to the right place. And so is the podcast at the end. Place there to give feedback, to interact with us, all the things that are there. I'm not going to go through it at the web page because if I tell you, you won't go there. So I'm just going to invite you to do that. And uh, know as always that we do appreciate as listeners your time and attention. And we know that while you may be doing something else while you're listening to this, you chose to listen to this while you're doing that something else. And so we never forget that you've invited us to at least have a little bit of your time and into your life. And we appreciate doing that and the feedback that we get from you. So um, again, on behalf of myself and on behalf of Brent and Chris and on, uh, on behalf of the podcast, just want to say thanks for listening. And we hope you join us next time. Thanks guys. Talk to you then. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more about the podcast at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Join us next time.